Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening. I'm Yvonne Stapp, and I welcome you to Science for the Public's Contemporary Science Issues and Innovations. Tonight, our topic is autism. The alarming global increase of autism has provoked all sorts of conjecture and some very harmful misinformation. There are countless studies of varying credibility on the subject, and people have every reason to be confused. We are very pleased to have with us Professor Mark Weiskopf, Associate Professor of Environmental and Occupational Epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health. Dr. Weiskopf brings to the issue of autism two critically important areas of expertise, neuroscience and epidemiology, plus the experience of very large international studies. Dr. Weiskopf, investigates the epidemiology of a range of neurological disorders, including autism, ALS, and uh, Parkinson's disease. He focuses on the relationship between these disorders and environmental toxicants. He and his colleagues are leaders in the global investigation of the dramatic increase in autism. In tonight's presentation, he'll explain what autism is and why this condition invites so many questionable causes. It's a great pleasure and a special honor to welcome Dr. Bark Weitzkopf. Thank you. Welcome. OK, thank you for inviting me, and thanks to the audience for coming to hear my talk. Um, so as, as Yvonne was saying, I'm going to be talking about the epidemiology of environmental toxicants and autism spectrum disorders. Uh, give you a little bit of background of how we look at these things, where we are in the science of this, and then introduce you to some recent work of mine looking in particular at air pollution and uh, risk of autism. So let me just start with what is autism. So autism was first described in 1943 by Dr. Leo Kanner and almost simultaneously and independently uh, by Hans uh, Asperger in Vienna, Austria, describing, as you might guess, the sort of Asperger's form of autism. Um, and this was really described as having several key behavioral features that many of you may well be aware of, know people who have autism spectrum disorder um, or people who are uh, involved with that in some way. But in, in large part what this is, several key behavioral features I've indicated here in the slide, but it really focuses on sort of a, a triad of impairments, social impairments, communication impairments, and then stereotypies, that is sort of repetitive behaviors of different sorts. Um, I will say, I, while I don't go into the definition of the behavior, we are at a point where we have in fact just changed the sort of standard diagnostic uh, criteria for autism from what's known as the Diagnostic Statistical Manual 4 to the, uh, or DSM-4 to DSM-5, which literally just changed in May. And uh, the, the, I won't go into, you know, we don't need to go into the details of exactly what that means, but what they have done is sort of split out, or not, no longer split out different aspects of autism as Asperger, autistic disorder, or um, pervasive developmental disorder, or others, and instead just created one rubric for all of this. And there are many issues that come around that. For our purposes in research, um, we, we don't always split those out, and we often will test cases using sort of gold standard behavioral uh, uh, indices like the uh, ADIR, uh, Autism Diagnos Diagnosis Interview Revised, um, or others like that to define our cases. Um, so getting into the question of the environment and autism, or toxicants and autism, the first question one really has to ask is why do we even think that the environment might be involved in autism, might be important? So it's a good question, and what I'm putting up here is a uh, graph from a recent paper uh, a little while ago from data in California that looks at the rate of autism over uh, the past several years, or really the prevalence rate, how many people are, are showing up in this particular registry in California with autism. And this is something that you're probably well aware of, that the, there has been this sort of dramatic increase in the number of cases of autism over the years. Um, now, I will say that one has to take this w uh, as a little bit of a caveat with this, which is that there's a lot of debate about whether there is a true increase in the biological thing we call autism, 
or whether there is some aspect of this that is accounted for by simply better awareness of autism, more diagnosis, better, better diagnosing, and more early diagnosing. And, and the fact of the matter is it's a very difficult question to get at. Uh, it, there's, there may be a contribution for a real rise. There is probably also a contribution for better diagnosis, better awareness. Uh, it's a little hard to tease that out. What I will say is that to the extent that any of this rise you're seeing here is real, that argues to some extent for environmental contribution to autism because we just don't get genetic changes that fast. Um, but that's, this isn't the only reason to think that the environment might be important. Um, this is a recent publication looking at uh, twins. And this is a mechanism we use in epidemiology a lot to try and dissect out genetic contributions and environmental contributions to whatever the disorder may be. Um, this is a study recently that came out also of data from a registry in California. There are issues with it and people will argue in, I, in either way, but the basic principle is one looks at twins and one compares monozygotic twins, which, uh, who share 100% of their genes, or dizygotic twins that share on average 50% of their genes. And the idea is if something is very, very strongly genetically driven, then monozygotic twins will have a very high rate of concordance. That is, if one of the twins has a disorder, uh, the other twin will as well. Um, whereas, it, you know, if that's not 100% and it's lower, that's uh, room for some environmental contribution. This particular study, uh, you know, you can look at statistics and do it different ways, and they came up with a rather high contribution for the environment. Other studies have seen not quite as high a contribution. Um, but, but if you look at sort of all of these studies, they certainly seem to point to some contribution from the environment. At this point, I should say that there's no question that there's a very strong genetic contribution to autism. What we're trying to see now is what is the role of the environment as well, and this, these data go a little bit of the ways towards saying that the environment is playing some role. The other thing that I should say is one other aspect when you look at twins that we can consider is dizygotic twins versus regular siblings. So dizygotic twins share about 50% of the genes, but so do regular siblings. And while this is also can be difficult depending on exactly how the study is done, if you look at all of the data, it sort of suggests uh, to some eyes, although you'll get arguments, that, that dizygotic twins seem to have a slightly higher rate than siblings, than your regular brothers and sisters. And what that means is, I mean, if it's, if it's just genetic, they of course share, each of them share 50% of their, percent of their genes, so it should be the same. Uh, if dizygotic twins are higher than just general siblings, that sort of suggests that there's something going on perhaps in the in utero environment or in early childhood where they share much more environment than some r other sibling that was born three years earlier or something like that. So that data also somewhat suggests that the environment may be involved and in fact further may suggest that the in utero period uh, is particularly important. Um, but there are also very, uh, there are reports of teratogens are things that uh, a mother is exposed to during pregnancy that cause birth complications. And several have been shown, or in many different settings, shown to uh, result in outcomes in the children that look a lot like autism. So one is rubella infection to the mother, another is alcohol use, valproic acid is an anti-seizure uh, medication, thalidomide was used uh, in, uh, to to uh, try and get around problems with pregnancy. In the old days, it was soon discovered that that was pretty bad and had a lot of side effects, but one of them seems to be to increase the risk of that pregnancy um, resulting in a child who's diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. There's another agent, uh, misoprostol, which was sort of a black market agent in Brazil used as an uh, abortifactant that it was sort of black market abortion procedures. Turned out it didn't work all that well for that and, and there was a much higher risk of a child whose mother had taken that uh, being going on to be diagnosed with autism. There's some more recent work also with SSRIs, the seroton uh, serotonin reuptake inhibitors uh, that are antidepressants that also may suggest an increased risk of autism for mothers who take those. And the, the point of these things, the reason I raise them, is that they sort of show a kind of proof of principle, which is that something external to the mother, external to the body, can be introduced and produce something that looks a lot like autism. So as a sort of proof of concept, it suggests that something in the environment can affect the likelihood of developing autism. So where are we and what's been done with autism uh, and toxicants specifically? As I said, there's a, there's a lot of focus on genetics, uh, rightly so. There's clearly a very strong component that is genetic in autism. Um, but I would say that, in fact, over the last several decades, the, the work has really been dominated by the genetics research. And it's only more recently that the, the sort of research focus has shifted a little bit more towards the environment. 
Um, and some of the early studies I'm showing here, uh, what people have basically done was to sort of collect a series of cases of children with autism, collect samples from them in some way or other, uh, and measured, in this case, metals uh, in these samples from the child with autism, and gotten several children who do not have autism, gotten the same samples and measured the metals in those, and you can pick other contaminants, but these were, I'm focusing on the metals here, and ask the very simple question of, do the children with autism show something different in their metal con content than the children without autism? Um, this has been done using uh, urine from these children, measuring metal content in that, hair samples, um, some studies as shown here took first baby haircut, others took baby teeth, um, and what, what's shown in the third column is just the numbers of people. So as I said, you get cases of children with autism in controls who do not have autism. Some these studies in general from an epidemiological perspective would be considered somewhat small, um, and sometimes the sort of balance of cases and controls is very skewed, which raises some questions. But um, the, the issue with this is there are they, they all sort of suggest differences in metal concentrations in different uh, media in the child. They're somewhat conflicting results, and it, and it gets a little difficult to interpret them all. But before I sort of give my take on that, I want to take a slight digression here for a moment into uh, epidemiology methods and how we actually go about doing our studies. So uh, unlike the laboratory, epidemiology is a study of people out there in, in populations. And it is not controllable the way a laboratory experiment is, where essentially everything is the same except for one element that the researcher changes, and you can then compare what's different between those two. Um, in epidemiology, we can look at people with the disease and without the disease, but we are not effectively randomizing them right, to some exposure. So there are many things that might account for differences between cases and controls of, in this case, autism, that are not related to the biology of why we get autism. So the, one of the principal ways we study this in epidemiology is something called the case control study. Um, there are other study methods, but often one starts with case control studies because they, are, they tend to be cheaper to do and they're faster. And they are what I just described, which is you get a series of cases uh, who have, in this case, autism. You get a series of children who do not have autism, and basically you compare them on certain characteristics. So uh, it's, it's a big advantage if the disease is rare because you can go to a clinic or a hospital and find a whole series of cases right there and you get them right away, rather than taking a large population and waiting for cases to develop. Um, this is a very, very powerful technique in epidemiology, and under the right conditions, it's, uh, it's very useful and, and valid. And the basic principle here is you identify your cases, as I said, from either a clinic or a hospital, as indicated by these red dots, and then you identify your controls and you compare them. Right? The idea is that all of these cases and controls should come from the, the same population, that you have some underlying populations, and some of those people then go on to get your disease of, in question, and others don't. And you essentially compare them, and this is a way to sort of sample that, that population. And as I said, when this is done correctly and when it's, uh, when it's valid, it's a very powerful way of assessing uh, what things may be linked to a particular disorder. The problem comes in what if you don't really know that you're comparing the proper people? So unfortunately, your cases come from the circle population and your controls come from the square population, and they may differ on a whole lot of other, uh, a, a lot of other factors. And the problem with these studies is that it's often difficult to know that. So um, it, it, this, the terminology for this in epidemiology is that study subject selection uh, uh, can be very tricky. As an example of this, and this is not uh, you know, this is not. This is a very uh, well-known paper, very high-profile journal, and uh, what they were looking at was whether consumption of coffee was related to pancreatic cancer. And so they did one of these case control studies where you go to a hospital basically and you collect from the cancer wing a lot of cases of pancreatic cancer, and then you find somewhere else people who don't have pancreatic cancer. And often the easiest thing to do is go to other areas of the hospital that don't have that disease and recruit those people into the study. So what they found was a very strong relationship with more coffee consumption and more pancreatic cancer. So it looks very good. The problem is these cases were recruited from Boston area hospitals and for essentially practical reasons the controls were recruited from other wings of the hospital. But whether they understood this or not, uh, and probably they you know, may not have even been aware that this was happening, it turned out once this was looked into later that the controls were 
oversampled from wards of the hospital that dealt with disorders that had GI conditions or gastrointestinal conditions. And of course, people who have gastrointestinal conditions have a very different pattern of coffee consumption than the rest of the population. And in fact, they often will drink less because it exacerbates their, their, uh, their condition. And so, of course, that's going to make these controls look like they have less exposure than the cases. And the basic problem here is that you were comparing two groups that weren't really comparable in other ways. Um, another way this can sort of raise its head and create problems in epidemiology uh, is shown here. This is a study of energy intake and the risk of Parkinson's disease. So the basic process here is that you, again, this is a retrospective case control study. They got cases of Parkinson's disease. They got a series of controls. And they essentially asked each set, you know, what was your, what's your regular diet and how much do you eat? And they would ask, you know, what was it 10 or 15 years ago before you developed Parkinson's disease? And what they basically saw was a very, very strong relationship between energy intake, overall energy intake, and the risk of developing Parkinson's disease. Very dramatic, very striking, so clearly uh, worthy of publication. The only issue is that a study came along later where the design was different, and this was a prospective cohort study where they had a whole collection of people that did not have Parkinson's disease, and they followed them over time to see who does develop Parkinson's. But before they develop it, they're questioning them regularly on their diet. And when they do it this way, there was no association between uh, the energy intake of the person and subsequent development of Parkinson's disease. And what we think is probably going on is shown by some additional data that was found later where one looked at energy intake or total dietary consumption and therefore total energy in intake of Parkinson's disease patients prior to and after getting diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And what this graph shows is that Parkinson's disease patients tend to have a higher energy intake that goes up around the time they're diagnosed with Parkinson's disease. And the problem with this is that uh, in the prospective study, here before in the negative numbers of years from diagnosis, that is before diagnosis, that is when diet is being assessed. Whereas in the case control study, you by definition have someone who already has the disease in front of you and you're questioning them on their diet. Now you're asking about their diet prior to Parkinson's, the problem is it's also reasonably well known that one's reporting of diet, even if asked about 10, 15 years later, is heavily influenced by current diet. So the current diet of these Parkinson's patients was higher, more energy intake. So again, they were, they were not comparing apples to apples, but apples to oranges. And, and this is a particular form of problem that uh, is known as reverse causation, where some aspect of the disease itself, whether it's the biology of the disease or behavior that, is, that goes along with the disease, may affect your exposure. So if you're measuring something after someone has the disease, you have this problem of, of knowing the proper temporality with this. So that's an issue that can always crop up in case control studies. And um, there, so the, as I described, the study selection problems, you've got to make sure you're comparing apples to apples. The issue of, of measuring and asking about things after the disease raises the problem of potentially enhanced recall or you know, different recall among people who have the disease because they've been racking their brains about what it was. Um, or just measurement error that the recall or the measurement of something is affected by the disease in some way and you get this reverse causation. So for these reasons, um, while if you can avoid them, you have a very valid study design that can, that can get you information quickly, we still like to see studies done in, a, in another form, which is called a cohort study, where you start, as I said, with a very large population of some sort. Um, and it has to be large because after some period of time, you need to have enough cases developed so you can do your statistics on them. Um, but you, the basic idea is you start with that population, you collect the data prospectively, that is before anything develops, and you basically follow them forward for the disorder or the disease. And this reduces bias in collecting your information because it's not going to be related to whether or not you have the disease because it's all collected before. So again, in this scenario, once again, we get our cases, but they've developed out of this population, and you can then just compare them to the rest of the population um, and, and get a much more, uh, uh, avoid a lot of the biases I mentioned in case control studies. Um, but you, or you can do something we call a nested case control study where maybe you can't measure everything or everybody else in your population, but you can truly randomly select controls from the, the defined population base that is giving rise to all your cases. And this allows you really to avoid a lot of those biases that can creep into case control studies. So if we go back to the studies of autism, some of the earlier ones that were done, uh, the issue here is that it's hard to tell to what degree these things may have been affected by some of these problems in case control 
control studies, they also tended to be somewhat small. So uh, there's a higher likelihood of sort of chance findings of different sorts. And in fact, with that in mind, one of the, one of the papers starred here, Adams et al., they in fact even noted that in their study, children with autism tended to have uh, or had significantly higher use of oral antibiotics during their first uh, two or three years of life. Um, and it's known that antibiotic use affects excretion of mercury due to alteration of gut flora. So already, while they did find in this study that the cases had higher mercury than the controls, they found even within their study evidence that some aspect of the disease, which was this aspect that drove oral antibiotic use to be much higher in the cases of autism, um, affected the mercury concentration. And so we've got there a scenario where we probably have some reverse causation going on. Um, and in fact, uh, so, this is, so this is sort of a summary of all the issues, right? When we look at these studies of cases of autism and controls and looking at metal content and different uh, media from the people, right, there are issues about controls in these studies are probably not randomly selected from un some underlying population. If we have parents who are very interested in, they think, oh, I've had a high exposure to mercury and I have a child with autism, I better go and get tested, then you are sort of self-selecting people who have high exposure and have a child with autism that can be problematic. Um, on the other hand, you might get people who uh, are very aware of this and limit their child's exposure. But the point is you're not getting a sort of random sample of the population. You're getting a particular type of person. And if that's different among the pe parents of children with autism and the children without, you have, uh, you have a problem. Um, the other issue is this reverse causation, that the disease itself, and we know there, there are many very strong behavioral aspects. It's a behavioral disorder. Um, children with autism, that if that in some way affects their exposure to toxicants and you're measuring them when the child is in front of you, you can have this reverse causation issue. Um, in fact, this, so this is a, uh, a much larger study that was definitely more methodologically rigorous from an epidemiological standpoint. It's known as the CHARGE study out of the MIND Institute at UC Davis. Um, and they had many more cases and controls. So in the second panel here are children with autism. On the top panel is typically developing children, and on the bottom panel, children with other developmental disorders. Um, and they recruited these kids when they were about two to four or so, and they took blood samples at the time. They asked all sorts of questions of the parents. Um, and in fact, what they found here was that if you looked at the blood of these children, in fact, the children with autism had lower mercury levels than uh, the children without. Um, and in that even, but even that difference was entirely explained by the difference in fish consumption. So we know that children with autism have very strong behavioral characteristics and they may just not like to eat particular types of food. That seems to be the case here where they ate less fish, so they had less mercury because that's the predominant source of mercury for, for, uh, for humans. So um, with that in mind, the, the issue is, you know, how do we get around this problem where autism develops typically maybe, you know, the median age of diagnosis is probably around four or so. So if you're trying to do a study when you're getting someone who already has autism into your study, how do you get around this issue that you might be measuring something that is affected by the disease in some way? So recently, somewhat more recently, several studies have tried to, to get around this. And, and one of the approaches to doing that is to separate out, look for alternative ways of assessing a person's exposure to some contaminant. And in particular, doing it in a way that really separates out the person from the exposure assessment. Uh, and uh, I'm going to focus on air pollution uh, because there are several papers now that have started to look at this. It's not the only arena where this is done. This has been done also with pesticide exposure, things of that sort. But the way, uh, a few different ways people have tried to do this is uh, they've looked at more um, databases that are collected that estimate exposure around the United States that are totally independent of any individual, you or me. So the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency tracks things like toxic releases from industry, and there are maps around the entire country of any region how much uh, of, of different toxicants have been released by industry into the environment. That's one way. They also um, have monitors around the country that measure different aspects of air pollution. And somewhat based on those monitors, as well as based on understanding what things produce pollution, they've created maps that uh, essentially estimate exposures to different contaminants in the air for any census tract in the United States. Um, there's a lot of error associated with that. They don't, they're models. They don't always get it completely right. But the critical thing for our purposes here is that if you're going to assign someone exposure based on where they live and this model, it is completely independent of whether or not the child has autism or not. So we can take out this problem of reverse causation in some way. Um, other things people have looked at is simply sort of uh, distance to roadways as an indicator of potential exposure to traffic-related pollutants. 
Um, and uh, in, in particular, I'll focus on uh, a couple papers that used this, this modeling of different air pollutants by census tract across the U.S. by the U.S. Uh, EPA, um, and a couple studies that explored where a mother lived during or around the time of pregnancy and her likelihood of having a child that went on to be diagnosed with an autism spectrum disorder. And the first of those studies came out of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, where they found cases through a uh, surveillance system in, in California, basically, 284 kids with autism spectrum disorder, and 657 controls that they could get sort of from uh, birth certificate information in these areas of California. And then, so independent of those cases and controls, they took this US EPA data set and looked at, well, what were the levels of different contaminants in the census tract where the mothers lived around the time of pregnancy? Um, as I said, those models are based on knowledge of where pollutants come from, how they distribute in the air, different meteorological conditions, things of that sort. Um, and they collected information on things like maternal age and education and child race that you can sort of use to try and make sure those things aren't explaining any association you might find with, uh, with an air pollutant. And sure enough, these folks did find some association. They, fo they tried to focus on some chemicals that, that had sort of an, un an understanding already that there might be neurotoxic properties, or at least that they got into the fetus, uh, could pass through the placenta, things of that sort. Um, now, there are many, many toxicants in these models, but uh, here what they found in particular was a higher uh, risk of a mother's child going on to develop autism if that mother was in a census tract at a higher level of exposure to metals. Um, or chlor a series of chlorinated solvents. So this was a very interesting report, one of the first of this type to come out in 2006. Um, and it was sort of there that sort of spurred my own work and uh, the idea to try and do this in a much larger population, uh, not just the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, in between also, uh, Amy Kalkbrenner and colleagues at uh, UNC in North Carolina also did a similar study using a population in North Carolina and West Virginia and found not exactly the same thing, but also some signals of something going on with air pollutants. Um, now, that said, all of these studies, including the ones that looked at traffic-related pollutants and distance to roadways, uh, there are still issues that one needs to consider with these. They're, they're all, they were all sort of restricted geographic areas, maybe the San Francisco Bay Area. Another one looked at monitor data in the LA County area. There's the one in North Carolina and West Virginia. Um, some of these studies uh, took case information from registries. That can be a bit of a problem because of who actually gets into the registry. Uh, not necessarily a problem, but there can be, there can be issues there. Uh, the, some are case control studies where we have to uh, ask ourselves, you know, could there be some of these biases I described getting into how one selects cases and controls. And then, of course, there's this strong issue of the fact that when you use particularly this US EPA model of these pollutants by census tract, there are almost 200 of these pollutants. So, uh, you know, one could just, uh, by chance, some might look like they uh, are associated with autism, but, you know, that's just, that's just chance. So what we um, wanted to set out to do, given this background, was to examine this association between air pollution and autism spectrum disorders um, across the entire U.S. in a very large, well-defined cohort. And to avoid, to some degree, this problem of just focusing on, you know, potentially picking a few ones that looked good out of a whole series of almost 200, we decided a priority to focus on uh, 14 or so that had been suggested by these previous reports to have a higher association or to be associated with a higher risk of autism spectrum disorder. So we uh, do this in the context of a very large study uh, that we have at Harvard known as the Nurses Health Study, and there are actually more than one. There's number one and two. We used uh, the Nurses Health Study 2. So this is a, a study of over 100,000 um, female nurses. So they're all medically trained. They were enrolled uh, in 1989. At the time, they were 25 to 42, and they've been they were recruited initially from 14 states, but they've now dispersed to across the entire United States. They're followed every two years by questionnaire to get a whole series of uh, different uh, lifestyle data and all sorts of other information from them. And in 2005, we um, asked them on their regular questionnaire whether they had a child with autism spectrum disorders, and specifically autism, Asperger's syndrome, or other autism spectrum disorder. Um, of those people uh, that were queried in 2005, uh, and uh, 839 said they had a child with autism. Uh, 
So instead of just going on that uh, maternal report, we followed up with these nurses in 2007, or just after 2007, with a follow-up questionnaire to get a few extra details on this. And because of the procedures of Nurses Health Study, we could only follow up with 756. But of those, 84% did respond to our questionnaire. And in the end, since we were using this EPA data, we needed to know their address. We needed to know where they lived so we could link air pollutant levels with where the mother was during pregnancy. And there were 329 mothers uh, or children with autism born between 1987 uh, and 2002 uh, that we had sufficient data and we made some exclusions of genetic syndromes that, uh, that also produce something that looks like autism. And then we had to exclude a few people who we couldn't know exactly where their address was and it's called the process of geocoding that we couldn't do. Um, but beyond that, as part of this, uh, to further validate this maternal report of whether the child had autism or not, we uh, randomly selected a set of 50 nurses to do a much more detailed assessment of the behavior of the child with one of these gold standards. Uh, in this case, the autism diagnostic interview revised. Um, and in fact, uh, as we suspected, particularly given that these are all medically trained women, that their report would be pretty good. And in fact, that's basically what we saw. So about 86 percent or 46, 43, 86 percent of these 50 moms met full criteria for autism. Another 10 percent missed by one point, which is basically considered uh, a, a clinically significant autism. And then another two didn't quite meet those cutoffs, but they were clearly much higher on these scales than a typically developing child. So our validation of this was, was uh, very, very good. So uh, what are we, who are we comparing now? So we're in a scenario where we have a defined population, this Nurses Health Study 2 and the women uh, who responded to that questionnaire. So as controls, the comparison that we're making between the uh, children with autism are children of mothers who said they had no children with autism spectrum disorder. And we randomly just took one kid per mother so that we didn't run into correlation problems. But uh, in this massive population, that, what that left us with was almost 22,000 <laughs> controls to compare. So as I said, we use this EPA uh, hazardous air pollutant data that, uh, that has modeled these pollutants for every census tract in the U.S. And that process is actually done not every year. And at the moment, I think there are four. There may be a newer one more recently. They're, they're done in, they've been done for 1990, 96, 1999, and 2002. So clearly, they don't reflect every single year. So we had to assign any child's birth or uh, to any child the, the uh, pollutant levels based on uh, the mother's address when at, and the EPA data that was closest in time to that birth. Um, I will say that for most air pollutants, there's a very strong correlation from year to year. So uh, while this introduces some error, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, it's certainly very highly correlated. So the blue bars here indicate the span of births that would be assigned, for example, the 1990 air pollutant data, or 96, or 99, or 2002. So as I said, we focused on these 14 hazardous air pollutants, or HAPs, that had previously been reported to be associated with autism. We used a technique known as logistic regression, but we basically broke the exposure levels into five quintiles from lowest to highest. Also looked at a pooled metals. Uh, since many of those 14 were metals, we just sort of pooled them all. And very importantly, as I said, in the nurses' health study, we have a lot of data on these women. So we're able to control for a lot of other factors that could potentially uh, spuriously uh, create an association with air pollutants, not only individual level ones, but we can take census tract level data to look at medium income, percent of people with a college education, um, and, and a lot of that is designed to try and get around this, is this issue of ascertainment bias, that some people may just be more likely to get an autism diagnosis because of awareness or means or things of that sort. Um, we were able to control for a lot of these things, but it's also important to keep in mind that as a population of nurses, we sort of expected that uh, more so than probably a general population sample, these women would sort of know how to access the medical system, understand what's going on, and be less likely probably to suffer from these issues of ascertainment bias with some women more or less likely to uh, have their child diagnosed with autism. So just to sort of cut to the chase, what we, what we found is shown here. So in the first column, the, the, on the first column here is the particular pollutant in the air. And I'm going to show you two slides of this. This first one focuses on the metals. Um, in the second column is the results we got out of the Nurses' Health Study 2. And it's comparing uh, women who are in the top quintile or top 20 percent of exposure to this given any given pollutant to those in the bottom quintile, the bottom 20 percent. And for comparison, I'm showing you in, in the third column the results from that early San Francisco Bay Area study where they did very similar things, although they were comparing the top 25 percent to the bottom 50. 
Uh, and then in the last column, the results of the study from North Carolina and West Virginia, where they actually took a different approach. They, they were comparing it looking just as a linear thing. They also had subtle differences in their study design that may account for some differences in finding here. But what was most striking is actually just how similar our results across the entire United States were to those in that first uh, paper out of the San Francisco Bay Area. And in particular, the this sort of summing of the metals or a pooled metals category was, was very highly associated with uh, having a higher risk of autism spectrum disorder. A few that pop up here are uh, lead and mercury in, in the air. Uh, this this uh, second slide is, shows the other set. These are non-metals, but diesel particulate matter, PM is for particulate matter, was another very strong signal. Um, and as I said, several studies have looked at traffic-related pollutants. This would certainly be one of them. Um, methylene chloride was another that popped up out of, out of this. So um, that, that's really the first take home here is that we found startlingly, startlingly similar results to those from the Bay Area, uh, which of course, if this were all chance, uh, would not be completely expected. Um, but there is still this issue that, you know, there are many, many pollutants out there, and it's, it's for some reason are we kind of picking out ones that just happen to look good. So um, we tried to get around this by sort of finding a way to look at all of them at the same time in some way. And I'm going to walk you through this next slide because it's, it's not a typical way we show things, but um, I think it's illustrative uh, in, in this regard. So this is showing the, the result essentially for every toxicant that's in this, these EPA models. And in, in the grayed out diamonds you have there are all the ones that we didn't consider initially, those a priori ones. And the, the uh, sort of blue or darker uh, triangles are the, those a priori non-metals that we looked at, and the square, the red squares are the a priori metals. And the reason we're putting this here, so on the x, on, on the y-axis here, the odds ratio is our, uh, is our association measure, goes up, uh, you know, mean, if it goes up on this above one, it means that there is an increased risk of autism associated with higher exposure to this pollutant. And if it goes down, it means there's a decreased risk. And what's going on on the x-axis is we're moving out by the significance of the result. And so the p-value, which is how we sort of measure significance, goes down as you move to the right. And a smaller p-value means a more significant result. The reason I'm showing it this way is that if, if this was all just noise, if you just sort of threw these data at, at the chalkboard and then analyzed them for this, what you would most likely expect to see is sort of a fanning out of uh, a set of some that look like they cause autism or associate with more autism, some that are associated with less autism, but basically a kind of equal uh, slurry of results around this one here, which is no, which is no effect, essentially, no association. Um, and that is, to some degree, what you see below a p-value of about 0.05, which is often what we take as kind of a, a level of statistical significance we, we expect to see or would like to see. But once you get beyond that, at the more significant results, there's clearly a sort of set of pollutants that seem like they are associated with more risk of autism uh, and, and that is not balanced by ones on the other side, sort of suggesting that there's some signal there uh, that is driving something going on. Now, I will say that one of the issues here is that a lot of these pollutants are very highly correlated. And so when you get things that are highly correlated, it's very difficult to tease out which one of several that go together strongly. Uh, you know, when you see one, do you see the other? If they travel together a lot, it's hard to tease out if there's a true association, which one is causing it, or maybe which set are causing it. And that's an issue that we really struggle with in this data. And, and I think what this suggests is that there, there is some signal in there, but it's very hard to isolate it to something specific, which one of, specific one or sets of these are related. Um, I should also say that we, we uh, I didn't mention before, but autism is very heavily dominated by boys. So there's about a four to one ratio of boys to girls and who develops autism. Um, so we wanted to, we did want to look somewhat separately at this. There's some reasons, you know, there's some genetic syndromes that, for example, uh, uh, lead to autism in girls and not boys, things of that sort. So we separate our, separated out our results by uh, looking at boys and girls separately. And with the strong caveat that, as you can see from this slide, we only had 46 girls with autism compared to almost 300 boys. So with that small number of girls, it can be hard to uh, see, see things in there, and you can get somewhat, uh, somewhat unstable results. Um, but, but the pattern of what it looks like here is that 
our findings are, are dominated by these effects in boys. Um, we're, we're not sure exactly what that is. That holds for the metals. That also holds for most of the non-metals of our a priori set. Um, some, that's not the case. Uh, diesel particulate matter in one, methylene chloride in another seem to trend both ways for boys and girls. But it certainly is of interest, and, and several others have uh, looked at things, you know, reports are out there that sometimes you see things more in, in uh, boys versus girls or, or the other way around. But it's an interesting thing that we are hoping to follow up on at this stage. Um, this is just to show you what I've showed you before is all the fifth with the top 20% versus the bottom 20%. Uh, this is just to show how these things go as you move up in exposure levels. And you can see with some of them, this is just for boys. These are the ones that had very significant trends, uh, other than the diesel exposure in girls. And, and you can see in, in the, that's the one out of all the exposures to girls that did seem to show a sort of increasing relationship, a dose response effect with more of the exposure, more chance of having autism. Um, but things generally tended to climb up, but they were, they bounce around a little bit. <coughs> So we did several other things. Uh, so other than that graph I showed you that tried to say, well, if this was all noise, what, you know, would it just be an a, a even pattern around no result? Um, there are other statistical tricks you can do to sort of look at whether what you're seeing is, is driven by just the fact that you're looking at many things, something called a false discovery rate adjustment we did, didn't seem to affect our results. Um, and we did several sensitivity analyses focusing just on that pooled metals uh, metric just because we had so many things to look at. And in fact, the results got slightly stronger when we restricted this to the six most populous states in the United States. And basically, we got very similar results if we further adjusted our, our, our findings for uh, family income, the partner's education level, or the mother's smoking during pregnancy. Um, there's also some question about combining these EPA models from different years. So when we restricted to just one year, we again saw uh, very similar results. There was some attenuation when we tried to adjust for uh, population density, but that's a very important predictor of exposure levels, usually air pollution levels, and so it can get tricky to try and, uh, try and adjust for that separately. Um, as I said, it's, you know, we'd like to know, is there something in there in particular that is driving this? Is there one of these exposures or some set of these exposures that are more important and the others are sort of just along for the ride because they happen to go along with another exposure? Um, and as I said, frankly, that's a little hard to do. Our, our exploration for that tried to look at some of the sort of top hits here. There was maybe some suggestion that this uh, solvent methylene chloride might, might be a strong signal. Um, another one that diesel particulate matter might be the one driving this. But the upshot from that is that uh, with this data as we have it, it's very hard to dissect that out. So obviously even, even sort of prospective cohort studies or, or any study designed in epidemiology not being a very, very controlled environment like the lab has limitations. Everyone has limitations. It's one of the reasons we need to sort of see results in many different settings. Uh, and see those be relatively consistent to have more confidence in what we're seeing. And our study has limitations as well. The, the major one of these is um, the issue of exposure misclassification, right? These are modeled levels of air pollutants by census tract. Uh, the models, you know, have their quirks about them and may not be modeling it exactly right. Uh, they're outdoor pollutants. We spend a lot of time indoors. There are different sets there that can differ. Um, it's not at the nurse's address, specific address. It's the entire census tract she's in, so it's not specific that way. And there's the issue of nurses move around, right? They may change addresses, but even if they don't, they don't spend all their time at their front doorstep um, or in, even just in their census tract. Um, all of that leads to what we call exposure misclassification, which means we're not we're not really completely accurately measuring how much of, say, diesel particulate matter they are truly exposed to. The issue is in these studies where we've separated out the exposure assessment from the case status itself, and the case status is not influencing our exposure metric, that type of error, that misclassification, is known as non-differential misclassification, which means that we are equally likely to misclassify a case as we are a control. And for statistical reasons, that is very well known to bias results towards the null. So it is, it is much less likely to produce a spurious result as it is to mask a true association between things. So the fact that we still see things in the face of a lot of misclassification here is, is pretty striking. 
Um, we, of course, in any epidemiology study, have issues of confounding, and, and that's an epidemiological term, but basically what it means is that something else that you haven't measured actually goes along with the pollutant you're looking at, and is the thing truly leading to autism, and you just think it's the pollutant because those things go together. Um, we tried, as I said, to adjust for a lot of other factors that might be doing that, but one can always uh, never be completely sure about that. So in, in summary for, for this study, it, it really strengthens the evidence for an association with air pollution. We've gone on to a national scale now as opposed to uh, smaller areas within particular states. Um, and partly because it is national scale, we had, uh, w overall we had much higher pollutant exposure levels and a much wider range of pollutant exposure levels, which uh, in general a much wider range, which uh, really facilitates, because of statistical reasons, one's ability to look at uh, associations. Um, and very importantly, we were doing this within a very well-defined cohort, the Nurses Health Study too. And, and that I ca keep coming back to as a very important um, aspect of this that helps avoid a lot of biases that can creep into other types of studies. Um, and we did see, though, that the, the a priori uh, pollutants, the ones that other studies had seemed to suggest were related, we did, in fact, see the strongest signals with those, or those were certainly the ones that, you know, pre preferentially sort of dominated the associations we were looking at. But identifying which particular one is, at this stage, still quite tricky. And as I said, there's, we had some evidence for something that might be sex-specific that we want to explore more. Um, but so now to kind of summarize overall where we are, right, the, so these initial studies into toxicants and, and, and autism um, were certainly suggestive. They were small, but they all had a lot of issues that, uh, you know, make one wonder. They certainly drive further research, but they had methodological issues that, that uh, certainly raised questions about them. So they were small, p questionable recruitment practices. Some reverse causality issues are obviously probably playing a role. And, and also, were they really looking at the proper exposure point? If, if as the charge study of mercury in blood showed, children already have autism, you didn't see much difference in mercury level. Now, that certainly says that once you have autism, it doesn't seem like mercury differs between, in blood between kids with autism and kids without. But it doesn't say that the mercury level in the mother circulating when she was pregnant is not related. And that's simply because that's not what you're measuring when you're taking a blood sample of someone who already has autism. So these subsequent studies definitely tried to improve on this, first getting much better on sort of methodological rigor from an epidemiological standpoint, but also in trying to address this issue of exposure timing by, or reverse causality by separating out the exposure assessment from the case status. But as case control studies fundamentally, they still have this problem of if you're actually trying to measure things from the children themselves, you can have this problem with reverse causation or or also the issue of simply not measuring a toxicant at the time point we think it might be having an effect. So um, at the moment, what's sort of exciting in this field is that I think these studies are, are getting much stronger from a methodological standpoint. Um, they're advancing in epi methodological rigor, and, uh, and they're also getting better at assessing exposure at the, at, the, at the right times, and I'll get into that more. The reason this is particularly exciting is that, of course, these types of toxic exposures, certainly air pollutants, um, are highly modifiable exposures. So, you know, we, we regulate levels of air pollutants in the air, and uh, if it turns out that these are also, in fact, truly leading to more cases of autism, we can do something about that, either on a public policy level or even a private behavior level. The next level of studies, though, that we have to get to is, is not relying on these sort of larger modeling of uh, exposures and sort of assigning exposures based on address, but really getting to what is in a mother when she is pregnant and how do those things relate to subsequent risk. The issue with that is we have to start, it, it's a harder study design because you have to start with a large population to get enough cases eventually. Many studies are now uh, getting set up and beginning to roll out that are trying to get at this issue better. Some are taking the approach of trying to find situations where samples from a mother while she was pregnant have been banked somewhere so we can go back to them and measure what was in, say, blood uh, while she was pregnant. Um, and know whether she has a child with autism now or not. Another approach has been to uh, recruit mothers who already have a child with autism, because as I said, the sibling recurrence rate of autism is quite high, possibly at about 20%. So if you recruit a mother who already has a child with autism when she's pregnant with the next child, you could have a smaller cohort of women because you're expecting to get many more cases of autism later. So we can prospectively measure things in their blood. 
We are also starting now at Harvard um, the Nurses Health Study 3, in fact, which is going to focus on uh, reproductive issues with the women. And, uh, and so as part of that, we are collecting samples or trying to collect samples while they're pregnant and we will be following them forward to see who develops autism. Other things about, you know, we can, there's a case of autism versus not. We can also consider behaviors and for statistical reasons that really helps us um, deal with smaller cohorts and go to places where exposures to particular toxicants may be quite high and work with a smaller population. Ultimately, we're hoping to get of course, to mechanisms that uh, are going on that lead to uh, autism, or which probably will involve, you know, things that interact with genes. So, as I said, there's a strong genetic component to autism, but most likely, I think a lot of people believe that there's going to be this interaction between certain uh, genetic profile and particular environmental exposures, um, leading to uh, the increased risk of autism. So with that, I'd just like to acknowledge my, my, the people who have done this with me and have, have uh, done the brunt of the work in some, sen in some uh, cases, Andrea Roberts and Ron Raz in particular, and Kristen Lyle, uh, as well as my other co-workers uh, shown on this slide here. And of course, I have to thank my funding, which actually came from the Department of Defense to look at uh, autism factors. Thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sorry. Um, if you're dealing with air pollution. I, I guess I have two parts of my question. Sure. Then it seems like the siblings would be much higher chance of autism, whether or not they're <coughs> twins or not. Um, and that you, you mentioned something about siblings and twins before, but it seems like by just taking one child, you're looking at just a different piece. And I also wondered if air pollution has gone up substantially since 1990, since the, the same time that you're talking about. I thought right. that we are doing, a better job. in some places, at least a little bit better right. on air pollution. So yeah. I was curious if you followed any of that. Yeah, so two, two very good questions. So the, the first one is, yeah, to some degree, if air pollution is involved uh, in a causal way, one might expect that, you would ha that siblings would have a higher rate just because they tend to be in the same areas, and if they're in a polluted area, they're going to be. That is, in fact, what we see. The, the sibling reoccurrence rate is quite high. I mean, a lot of that is probably genetics. What component is, is air pollution is a little hard to tell. Um, but so that, that, that is what we see, that the sibling rate is higher. Um, as far as the other question, that's a, that's a very good one, and, it's a, and it is a tricky one, right? So we are definitely getting better with many air pollutants. They're coming down overall. Um, the, the, I mean, in some areas, of course, that's not the case, but overall, it's generally getting better, and certainly with some pollutants like lead, that's come down tremendously. So the, the tricky parts of this are that, as I said, there is, a, there is a lot of debate, and you'll find people on both sides of this. Uh, I probably fall somewhere in the middle, but there are people who will very, um, uh, very adamantly support the idea that there is a very dramatic rise in true incidence of autism in the biology of it. And there are people who will argue very vociferously that there isn't, that this is just more awareness. There have been changes to legal processes that allow for benefits, and so more people are getting diagnosed. It's very hard to tell. but um, So that's always a bit of a concern when you're trying to sort of parallel the rise with what's going on with another pollutant. That said, it's true. I mean, a lot of air pollutants tend to be coming down, so what's going on? The, the other issue, though, that plays into that is that um, what's masked sometimes in this epidemiological approach of showing relative rates. So, you know, if you're at a high exposure level, you have twice the risk of having a child with autism. What's masked by that, that sounds very dramatic, but what's masked is how much of autism is actually uh, it, you know, caused by, if this is truly causal, is caused by the air pollution. So if, uh, just taking an extreme example, if 99% of cases of autism are driven by genetics and 1% is driven by the air pollution, then it's going to be very hard to pick out the signal of a changing rate in terms of uh, time. Does the Department of Defense care? <laughs> <laughs> I don't ask these questions. No. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I mean, I don't know the specific answer to that. What I, what I will say is that a lot of what they do does get driven by their, their constituency. And my uh, sort of guess, although I really don't know, is that they, they may have had service members that were uh, you know, very vocal about this. And maybe they were having, whether, whether, we don't know whether it's for any reason higher among a military population. But uh, it, you know, this is often driven by who, you know, the squeaky wheel gets the grease. So they, that's my guess is what's going on there. Suggesting possible 
I'm just suggesting other issues that have come to my mind. One is uh, genetically modified food, and the other is pacifi pacifier and what's in there. And I don't know, that's a, just a further study. It totally, maybe I'm just off the wall here. I don't know how you measure that. But um, I think the more, there is room for more here. Right, right. So you mean by the pacifiers, you mean like chemicals that might be in the pacifier yes, plastic? Yes, I don't know much like about that. it. I just know that I've heard that that's a big factor. Right. So it's a good question. There are issues of things. I think there was another one of these sessions on, on BPA, bisphenol A. Um, and there are these sort of plasticizers and things. They're, they're overall a large concern that we're looking into more. The, the issue really is that and they're all things that we could certainly explore. The issue is, um, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of at in early days of the environmental uh, toxic and exposures and autism to a large degree, certainly compared to the genetics. So a lot of these things, it's just a matter of having the right setting where we can really get at it. And sometimes the most difficult thing is assessing what a mother was really exposed to or what, you know, we think the in utero period is particularly relevant for many reasons. And so the focus has been on mothers while they are pregnant. Um, but the, the really tricky part in this toxic thing is often just how do we assess how much a mother was really exposed or whether she was exposed or not to something. And so for some of these things th that can be difficult to do, the best way is really to set up these studies where you can get the blood samples or some sample like that while she's pregnant and then you're able to sort of test for these things and look at it. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if, uh, if it's been proven that genes cause it mm -hmm. or do, the, or do uh, genes cause a vulnerability to it sure. and it needs a trigger and maybe the maybe the pollution is the trigger yes. to genetic vulnerability. Right. So e excellent, excellent question. Yeah. So I, I will say, as I said, that there's been a lot of genetics work in autism and probably 10, 20 years ago, maybe 20, the more there was the idea that we were going to find the autism gene that explains this all. That clearly hasn't happened. We, I mean, there is, there is a syndrome, Rett syndrome, that is, has a, you know, a very known genetic driver to that. But in general, for autism, we haven't found the autism gene. Now, there are many reasons why that might be the case. It might be that there are actually many genes that kind of go wrong or ha you, know, you have to have a different profile that, that drives it. And so as we look at one at a time, we don't see it unless we're looking at all the genes. But the other one is exactly what you said, is that it may well be that you know, your genetic profile kind of uh, you know, uh, you know, sets the sets the vulnerability, and then you need something else to come in to uh, to actually cause the the final step that leads to the disorder. There are some studies that have suggested that some with folate metabolism genes, things of that sort, where then a particular type of dietary intake might have more influence than people who don't have a particular profile. There's there's been some suggestion of of uh, certain genes that are involved with reacting to air pollutants that you know if you have a tip if you have a certain profile on that gene you would be more sensitive to the air pollutant so that that is definitely something we are exploring and and need to look at closely because I, I do think that that is going to be very important in the end that that there will be this combination of having a genetic vulnerability with some other environmental trigger that makes you more likely to, to get it if you have that Yes, sorry. If there is like a strong like uh, environmental factor, wouldn't there be like a population density factor as well and like m more densely like autistic increase in like cities and things like that and not in like the suburban areas? Uh, so sorry, can you rephrase? So you're saying if there, say, say that again, I'm not sure I got your question. Well, wouldn't there be all, like an increase in autism in like cities then instead of like suburban areas because, because of the like environmental, environmental factors? Yeah, so, so that's certainly a possibility. Now, not every toxicant is necessarily higher in urban areas. Um, but that, that certainly might be the case. And in fact, there is, a, there is to some degree when you look at the data, a kind of urban uh, urban aspect to autism, that it does seem to be somewhat higher in urban areas. You always have to wonder with that kind of stuff whether you're just seeing, you know, you're detecting the cases better in that scenario. But there is some suggestion that that may be the case. But again, you know, if it's, for example, pesticides, that may not be uh, more dominated by urban areas. That might be more farmlands. And there have been studies in California using a similar approach as I described for air pollution here, where you separate out the exposure assessment from the individual. Um, that does suggest a link to some pesticides used in, in, uh, on farms in California. Yeah. 
has there been any thought or attention given to like women in the workforce and that maybe some of the things are a little bit more acute and not you know industry specific and could you target a study to do you know heavy metals or something like that right so it's, it's a good question and this is this is but so often in environmental health one of the one of the sort of tenets is start where the exposures are highest and so a lot of especially neurological things but many other conditions as well our, our initial inclination you know our initial thinking that there may be a, a toxic in relation with an outcome comes from occupational studies because that's where you tend to notice it most first. That certainly happened with lead, for well, lead has a long, long history, but um, uh, other toxicants, that's the case just because their exposure levels are so much higher. So that, that thinking is absolutely right, is why, why don't we sort of focus there where these things might be highest. The, s the slight problem with that is that at the same time their exposures are higher, you're often talking much smaller populations. So right, we now think the latest data suggests one in 88 kids have autism. But even at that high rate, you know, if you have 1,000 moms, what does that give you? Maybe 10 to 12 cases of autism. And that's very small for these types of epidemiology studies we do. So that's something that kind of hinders that occupational approach. But, but it's not to say we don't try it. And, and uh, you know, the issue is finding the right setting where you can get enough cases have high exposures that are you know, reasonably similar enough. The one place where, where we could potentially get around that a bit that I try to argue for sometimes is rather than looking at whether you have autism or not, there are well-developed uh, scales of autistic-like behaviors. So if we believe that a diagnosis of autism is sort of the tip of the iceberg and that actually it's a spectrum that is a spectrum beyond the bottom level of, of our case definition, and we see this, there are these traits track genetically, they track in families, things of that sort, that if those traits really represent autism as well, that gives you now a sort of continuous, say, zero to 100 measure of you know, like, you know, autism-like behaviors. And for statistical reasons, that gives you a lot more power and you're, you can do studies in much smaller populations if you're using that kind of a continuous measure. So doing that may allow us to target more very specific populations that may be small but have very high exposure to these things. But it's a, it's a very good question. I'm sorry.